Hi, thanks for joining us for today's message from Calvary in Lake Havasu. Calvary exists to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. We hope today's message provides practical guidance to help you deepen your relationship with God. To follow along with the Life Notes, you can download them at calvaryaz.com forward slash life notes. Now, let's hear from the pastor. You can go ahead and have a seat and open your Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It's where we're going to be tonight. If you don't have a Bible, we'd love if you would uh, take one in the chairs in front of you. Uh, open up to page 1,142. And while you're doing that, I want to do a little shout out to our Parker campus. It's been a little while since we've been there. Uh, I've been there via video with you guys, so good to have you with us. You can go to the back table and grab a Bible if you'd like to. And uh, the good news is that soon uh, you'll be able to reach under the chair in front of you and grab a Bible in a chair that's far more comfortable than what you're using right now because that building is coming along. It's getting close and we're excited and uh, looking forward to opening that campus down there. Uh, but hey, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're kicking along. But uh, before we jump in, I wanna just uh, do a little shout out to uh, the Baja build. You guys saw the video at the beginning of that. And uh, it was an awesome trip. And you guys got a little sample of that. And uh, I want to thank John. He's one of our uh, trip attendees. He put that video together for us. And um, just an awesome trip. Uh, we'll be going back April 12th through 14th. If you want to, like, if you saw that and you're like, hey, I want to be a part of that, uh, that's our, our tentative dates for our next trip, April 12th through 14th. We'll have signups and all that stuff available shortly. But um, that, those trips are so powerful. We've done a couple of them so far. And, and they're so powerful just seeing what God can do in a short amount of time, but also seeing just what it can do for us as people uh, to grow in gratitude. And uh, I remember, uh, or wanna share this moment where Saturday, after we had kind of got all the walls up, the roof was up, the house structure was there, uh, we're sitting around back at the, the host homes and we're talking to our project leader down there who's with the, the Baja Bound organization who's leading uh, on the ground for us there. And she's got us in a circle and she goes around and says, hey, what is your number one complaint about the house you live in right now? And I knew she was leading me right into an emotional bear trap because um, I'm like, I know what I've complained about in my house so many times. I've complained about the color of the carpet more times than I could count but I just helped build a home for someone who's been living on a dirt floor and now is incredibly grateful for this bare concrete floor that they get to walk on every day. And I've been complaining because the color of my carpet isn't the color that I like. But I stepped into that emotional bear trap I shared and we kind of talked about the perspective and how perspective can help make us grateful for the things that we have, for what God has given us, for, for where we are. And really perspective is a really powerful thing. And we're going to be talking a little bit about that tonight, of just how perspective can help us see the things that are truly important. Because maybe it's uh, the thing that helps us be grateful for the things we have in life, but it's also the thing that helps us identify what's really important. That's perspective. It's, it's the thing that helps us sort through the things that, that in the moment we see is really significant, but in a grand scheme don't matter at all. And we've probably all been at that place where, where we get really worked up about something and then later realize, hey, it really wasn't that big of a deal. Maybe you've had an argument with your spouse and realize later on, or maybe realized in the middle of the argument, that it really wasn't as important as you made it. Maybe it was that thing, that, that decision point. You had a, a moment where you had to make a decision or there was a fork in the road in your life and, and you spent weeks stressing and losing sleep over that, trying to make the perfect decision only to realize a few months later that, it really didn't matter as much as you thought it did. Or maybe it was, was when you got that bad news or, or, or life threw you a curveball that you couldn't keep up with and, and you thought that this just kind of derailed everything only to see later on that God had worked it out anyways for you. That's perspective. It helps us see the things that really aren't as important as we feel like in the moment, but conversely, perspective is also the thing that helps us realize what's actually truly important. Because with time, the things that are important only grow to be more and more significant, more and more important in our life. And as we look at 1 Corinthians 15, that's exactly what Paul's gonna be doing. He's gonna be saying, hey, let's sort through some things and find out what's truly most important about our faith and what implications that has. So let's take a look. 1 Corinthians 15, we're gonna be working through uh, the entire chapter, kind of, sort of. I'm not reading the entire chapter. You can do that on your own. But 1 Corinthians 15, let's start in verse one and see what Paul has for us today. 
It says this, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and which you stand, and by which you were being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the 12, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, although some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James, then to the apostles, last of all, as to one untimely board, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, that was not I, but the grace of God that's with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. See, Paul's showing us what he believes is truly important, and, and as we sort through that, he says, hey, I'm delivering to you what's of first importance. He shows us that the, the ultimate good news, the most important thing, is Jesus' death and resurrection. He goes, hey, out of all the things in Scripture, out of all the things I've shared, now this is Paul who wrote about half of the New Testament, 13 books of the New Testament were written by Paul. There's a lot of encouragement, there's a lot of history, there's a lot of explanation, there's a lot of instruction that Paul has given. He's like, hey, all that's important, but here's what's of first importance. That Jesus died, that he was buried, and on the third day, he rose. Out of all of that, he said, this is what is most important. And when we unpack the, the significance behind that, we understand why Paul makes this so important. Because he goes, hey, first off, the, the, the important thing is that Jesus died for us. Jesus died for us as people who needed forgiveness, who needed salvation for our sins. He explains this in, in pretty good detail in the book of Romans. In, in chapter three, he says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God that all of us are sinners. There's none of us that can claim righteousness before the holy God of the universe. And because of that, in chapter six of Romans, he says that the wages of sin is death. That because we've sinned, because we've gone against the holy standard that, that God has presented for us, we deserve death. We deserve eternal separation from God, eternal punishment for our sins. And that, that can sound very harsh if you forget the fact that this is our doing. This isn't God saying, hey, I don't like you, here's your condemnation, but it's in response to our sin and rebellion. See, much like a, a criminal earns a prison sentence, we have earned our punishment for sin. But see, the good news is that Jesus came to die for us. Romans 5, 8 says that God showed his love to us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Paul says this is the thing that's of most importance, of first importance, is that Jesus died for us. And in that, we can have hope, we can have encouragement. That is good news, not because there's just a tragedy of, of someone dying, but it's good news because Jesus took our place in that death. Scripture explains that in that moment of him going to the cross for us, he stepped in, he, he took our place, he paid the penalty that we owed, he served our sentence that we should have. And as he hung there on the cross, he took on the condemnation, the weight, the punishment of the sins of everybody who calls on the name of Jesus for salvation. And so he's like, this is the good news, that Jesus died, that he was buried, because it means we can be forgiven, we can be reconciled to God because of what Jesus did for us. But we need the resurrection to complete this good news. Because otherwise, Jesus is just another martyr, he's just another person who was unjustly killed. And so Paul says, yes, he died, he was buried, but then he was raised from the dead. Three days later, in a miraculous turn of events, he rose from the grave, kind of beating everyone's expectations, even though Jesus had you know, spent three years saying that that's exactly what was going to happen. They're like, whoa, this is amazing news. But in that, he showed that he wasn't just a man. He wasn't just a religious leader. He wasn't just an average guy like me. He was the son of God and savior of the world. Because when he came out of that tomb, he showed that he's got power over sin and death. He's got power over evil. He's got the, the ultimate power that is unmatched by anything else in the universe. And he communicates the hope that we can have in him. And we'll get to that a little later on in this chapter. 
But Paul says, hey, this is the most important thing. And, and he even mixes in some personal testimony to this. Because he says, hey, uh, there's, there's some actual tangible things that happen in connection to this. He goes, hey, Jesus went and then appeared to Cephas, which is another name for Peter, then to the other disciples, and then to James and these 500 people who most of them are still alive, he's saying. Why does he say that? Well, he's he's inviting verification of this historical fact. And I'm gonna go on a little rabbit trail on this real quick because so often people say, oh, well, you know, the Bible's just a book. You can write anything down in there. Like, how do we actually know these things happened? How do we know that we can trust these things that, that Scripture records as facts? And it, it can't actually be trusted, except it can because it's got all these verifications in there. Because here's, here's some, some detail behind that. So we know that, that Jesus was crucified somewhere around uh, AD 30 to 33, somewhere in there. This book was written somewhere around AD 54. So let's just call it 20 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus, this book is written. Which is why he says the people that Jesus appeared to, most of them are still alive because it didn't happen that long ago. And this is important because all throughout the New Testament, whenever there's these significant moments they're listing specific cities. They're listing the names of the people who are present. They're listing their family information and this identifiable data to it so that the people who were first reading this could go and ask the people. They could go verify. And even if they weren't personally doing that, there's this verification because if, if I'm listed in some book that's history and they're lying about my involvement in it, I'm gonna say something. There's gonna be an uproar. The, 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 the gospel wouldn't have spread to all of these areas if it was full of lies. Instead of that, everywhere it went, people believed and the good news spread and more and more people came to trust in Jesus. Even though there were implications, even though there was persecution because the, the Jewish religious leaders didn't like that Jesus was called the Messiah, so they pushed back. Not because the facts were wrong, but because they didn't like the religious implications of Jesus as the Messiah. So the good news spread, so much so, Paul even says the good news came to him and it changed his life. You can read about Paul's life in Acts chapter eight and nine, but the short version of it is that, that he was one of those Jewish religious leaders. He was an elite who was part of the, the educational system. He was the person trying to preserve this, the, the Jewish traditions, so much so that he hated Christians and spent his days seeking them out and imprisoning them, and even at points killing them. Because he's like, you, you guys are, or, or teaching heresy. This isn't, tr this isn't the, the, the religious truth that we've agreed upon. And so you need to be eradicated. But in Acts chapter nine, Jesus meets him face to face on a road while he was going to pursue Christians to kill again. And everything changed for Paul. His, his entire life changed the purpose of what he was doing. Even it points his identity and his schedule and his career. Everything changed and now he's, he's not persecuting them. He is he's perpetuating the good news of Jesus. He's seeking new areas to go and deliver it and preach it and convince people that Jesus died, was buried, and raised three days later. But the people he's writing to have this disagreement about the resurrection. There, there's some, some concerns about it, was the resurrection real and what does that mean for us? Do we as people have a resurrection? There's a disagreement. So Paul, as he continues, he kind of goes on a little rabbit trail. He's like, let's pretend for a minute the resurrection didn't happen and that we don't have a resurrection as people. So let's keep reading verse 12. Let's see where he takes us. He says this, now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there's no resurrection of the dead? But if there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We're even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it's true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. Catch this in verse 19. He says, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. See, Paul's saying, hey, if, if Christ is not raised, then nothing matters. He's like, let's pretend for a minute that this didn't happen. 
And if that's the case, none of this matters, he says. The, the, the things we've been studying and pursuing, the work we've been doing, the, the, the direction of our life is all pointless without that. He says, if, if Christ has not been raised, then what are we doing? He even calls it out in verse 17. He says, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. He's like, hey, if Jesus didn't rise from the grave, everything that you've pursued with faith and your religious efforts and all your studying, it's all pointless and done nothing for your sins. And that's because so much of what we believe is tied up to those events in that order that Christ was, was crucified, buried, and raised three days later because that is our entire explanation for how we have forgiveness of our sins. And if that didn't happen, then we don't have forgiveness of our sins. And also, if that didn't happen, then what else is the Bible lying about? Which is why the accuracy and authenticity of scripture is so important, because if there's a single point where we go, hey, it's false, it's not true, then everything else loses its credibility. So Paul says, hey, it, it, it's, it's important because your faith is pointless without it, but also our hope is, is empty and worthless without the resurrection of Jesus. Verse 19 again, he says, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. So people should feel sorry for us if this is the only hope we have. And we understand what he's meaning by that because we look around our world and we see problems and brokenness and pain and despair. We see economic issues and disease and tragedy. We see political corruption and terrorism. We see violence and war and bloodshed. We see all these things that cause us to go, our world is broken in need of hope. And, and Jesus is that hope that can come into a broken and sin-filled world. But if he isn't real, if he didn't die for our sins on the cross, get buried and raised three days later, then he's like, this, this is all we have then. And that's really, really sad for us. So now that we've got this really good news, let's, let's see where Paul goes from there. Verse 20, he says this, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of all who have fallen asleep, for as by man came death, and by a man has also come resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive, but each to his own order. Christ the first fruits, then it has come in those who belong in Christ. See, the good news is, is that since Christ is raised, that is all that matters. That is the pivot point for all of this, that because Jesus did come out of that grave, he rose from the tomb three days after his crucifixion. That's all that matters. That is the pivot point for all of our hope, for all of our purpose, for all of our direction in life, for all of our faith in, in religious efforts. Everything hinges on that point right there. And for Paul, there's some implications that come out of that great news that Jesus rose from the dead. And the first is that we have rich hope beyond this life. And, and this is in contrast to what he said, without Jesus, without the resurrection, we've got no hope. People should feel sorry for us. People should pity us in our empty hope. But because of the resurrection, we have rich hope. And he has a little history lesson of how we got to this place. He, he mentions Adam there. So Adam and Eve, the very first people that God had created in the beginning of the Bible, the book of Exodus, God creates the entire world, creates the first people, Adam and Eve, and they're in perfection. There's no sin. There's no brokenness. There's no war or terrorism. There's no disease or bloodshed. But there's a rule. One rule that God has given them, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And they thought that was a good rule, so they broke it and they ate from that tree. <laughs> and in that, they created a pattern. They created this pattern of rebellion and sin against the God of the universe that has been passed on from generation to generation. You don't have to teach people to sin. You don't have to teach young ones how to rebel against their parents. They do it in, innately because it's part of our nature as broken and fallen people. But with that also came all of the brokenness of our world. And all throughout scripture you see this referred to that Adam, this first man, this, this, this person who created this pattern of sin and rebellion brings all of this brokenness into life. But Jesus comes as the true and perfect Adam, the one who, to undo what, what Adam had done, to do what Adam could not do. 
because Jesus comes as fully man and fully God, lives a perfect and sinless life. He didn't rebel against the commandments of God, even at those points of intense pain and sacrifice of going to the cross. But Jesus comes as that, that perfect, sinless person, but then died on the cross so that we could be forgiven to undo this condemnation that Adam passed down of death and brokenness. But with that also comes the hope of eternity, the, the hope that when, when we die here, that isn't the end of the road for us, but that we have a resurrection, a bodily resurrection. Our life is made new in eternity with God in heaven. That's the good news that Jesus came and explained to us. And that's the thing that gives us hope. It gives us hope beyond just this life here because this isn't everything for us. This isn't the end for us. And in those moments where we encounter the brokenness of our world, we can rejoice knowing that it gets better that there is hope on the horizon for us who believe in Jesus and call him our savior because there's a place with no brokenness, with no pain, with no disease, with no crying or, or cancer or war. It's simply rejoicing and perfection and union with our savior. But the question is, are we going to keep that perspective for our life? Are we going to, to have an eternal perspective? Are we going to revert to making this the most important thing? See, I think so often we make our life today and the things that we have, the responsibilities, the commitments we have, the most important thing in our life. And it shortchanges the hope that we can have in Jesus by not having that eternal perspective. See, it reminds me of, of Jesus in Matthew 6. He's speaking to this and he says, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moths nor rust destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What's important to you? Is it the fleeting things here that, that can be destroyed or taken away, or is it investing in eternity by serving God with your life and investing in the eternity that you have with him? Because the, the truth of Jesus and his resurrection brings rich hope beyond this life, but also shows that we have power in difficult times. Paul, in, in this section of 1 Corinthians, goes on to, to describe some of the difficulties he had in ministry and some of the challenges and some of the difficulties, but how because of the truth of Jesus and his resurrection, he had hope, he had power to push through in those difficult moments. And this goes back to what we understand about salvation, that what happens when we trust in Jesus. And what we understand is that, that when we place our faith in Jesus, when we believe he is the perfect son of God and savior of the world, that he died on a cross to pay for our sins and rose, and we go, hey, I believe that, and I'm committing to following him, then the Holy Spirit, the third member of the Trinity, comes into our life, dwells with us, and the Holy Spirit acts as our helper, as our guide. He convicts us of sin. He, he gives us instruction and assistance, but also he brings the power of God to bear in our day-to-day -day life. The power of the one true living God, the God of the universe, is in each and every one of us who believe in Jesus. And in Romans 8, verse 11, it describes that that Holy Spirit who dwells in us, it's the, it, it brings the same power that rose Jesus from the dead. So the truth is that, that that power that resurrected Jesus from that tomb after three days is the same power that the Holy Spirit's bringing into our life every single day. So we don't have to navigate the tragedies under our own power. We don't have to navigate the difficulties and the pain and the brokenness of life with our own power because we've got the power of God in us, which makes us wonder, why do we so often try to do life on our own? Why do we question the, the authority of Scripture and why do we defend our rebellion against it? Why do we try and solve our problems without going to God? And the same power that rose Jesus from the dead is in us through the Holy Spirit. See, the resurrection gives us power in those difficult times, but also brings the good news that we have victory over fear. So I want you to look over or turn over or scroll over, or however you're looking at it, to the end of chapter 15. Starting in verse 54, as Paul wraps up this thought, he says this, he says, when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? 
The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. See, Paul says, hey, the, the scariest thing, the thing that people fear the most, except for maybe public speaking, but the thing that, that people fear the most is death. And the truth of Jesus and his death and resurrection for us takes away all of the power of that fear. Because again, that's not the end for those of us who believe in Jesus. There's hope on the other side of that because of Jesus and his resurrection. His resurrection is that example that, hey, we have that same hope. We have that same promise that that is going to be us at the end of our life if we trust in Jesus as our Savior. And that gives so much power over the scariest thing that exists. Because I've sat with people as they're, they're, they're in their final moments of life and seen the hope that they're clinging to in Jesus. And how as they're knowing that the end is near, that they know it's okay because they're gonna be with Jesus in eternity. They know that heaven is their destination and Jesus is their hope. And it's not just in the, the final deathbed moments, but in the everyday life that, that causes fear. Wherever fear creeps in, if it's about our health and our safety, if it's about our comfort or our preferences, whatever fear creeps in, the hope of Jesus and his resurrection gives us power over that gives us victory over that fear. But all this comes back to, do you believe that this is true? Do you believe that Jesus was crucified for us? He was buried in three days rose. If not, we know that the, the hope that is available for you, and, and it's our prayer that you would step into that life-changing hope. And we've got a prayer team down here after service that would love to talk and pray with you. But if you do believe that, then let me ask you are, you, are you clinging to that? Do you see that of first importance? Are you allowing that to give you perspective on what's important, on where you can have hope, on where you can have power, on what gives you victory in your life because the resurrection of Jesus is the most important thing. And I pray that you would be living your life putting that as the, the most important thing, of first importance, Paul says, and that every day you would continue in that, as he says, knowing that in the Lord your labor of faith is not in vain. So today, will you walk with that as your first importance? Let's pray together. God, we thank you that we can trust in you, that we can have faith in you that, that isn't empty that isn't something that, that leaves us wanting more or leaves us questioning, but God, that fills us with life and hope and purpose. And God, I pray today that you would help us. Help us be people who, who have perspective that is based on the truth of your word, that gives us instruction and guidance with our life of, of what we're living for. God, help us to not live for the fleeting things of this world, but help us to live serving you, of putting you as the most important thing in our life. God, help us to understand the hope and the, the encouragement and the good news that the resurrection of Jesus brings, not just for the eventual one-day moment of our death, but for everyday life and how it, it brings hope and power and encouragement to us. God, what we're asking is that this good news wouldn't just be facts that we hold in our mind, but it would be truth that transform our life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If today's message spoke to you and you would like to support the ministry of Calvary, you can do so by visiting our website, calvaryaz.com. The homepage has links to contact us, to give, listen to past sermons, and subscribe to the Word for the Day daily devotionals. That's it for today. I hope you'll join us again next week. Bye-bye.